So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeroen Aarsen. I'm uh, um, a childhood advisor at Sardes in Utrecht. And Sardes is one of the, um, the ISA members, the Dutch ISA members. And I'm also uh, uh, part of the board of ISA. And it's my honor, my pleasure, to introduce to you the first keynote speaker, Paul Leseman, from uh, Professor of Education in Utrecht University. I have known Paul for quite some time, and uh, not in the least because he and his team uh, are working together with Sardes to carry out the National Quality Monitor uh, of Childcare. And we're also, both uh, organizations are all also involved in a new large interdisciplinary project called Evening, Evening, which will be the first natural experiment in the Netherlands to test whether or not targeted ECEC programs really lead to equal opportunities. Paul is a man of many traits, but for the time being, I'm just focusing on his academic ones. Um, he puts his whole heart into themes such as inclusion and diversity, social justice, and a long list of publications by his hand reflects his broad interest in many different aspects of early childhood development, from multilingualism to executive function, from spatial cognition to cultural diversity. He's been there, done that. But, and I must stress this here, he always regards these topics with the eye of the researcher. He always puts on his scientific safety goggles. So he's an empiricist and he lets the data speak uh, for themselves, but also he, he gives a good explanation. He's a keen translator of what these data mean for practice and for policy uh, of ECEC. And in this respect, I should mention that he is an important advisor for the Ministry of Education in the Netherlands. Today, he will take you on a journey across some of the still um, existing major challenges regarding um, uh, the quality and inclusiveness of ECEC. And no doubt, uh, his story will be richly illuminated by relevant research evidence. Before I call him on the stage, I have to say that if you have any questions, and I'm sure you will have lots of questions, there won't be any time for a, que un a question answer sequence. Please use your app. Everyone has the app. The princess was talking about digital the digital age, so I hope everyone has the app. So what you can do, and I'm not going to, to, to show it because it, that takes too much time, but if you have the app, if you open it, on the bottom line, there is a, a field saying, uh, what's on your mind? We want to know what is on your mind uh, related to Paul's talk uh, as much as possible. So, uh, and in the end, we will put the questions on the screen and we can make a, a, a selection. Um, we, it's also a little bit experimental, let's see how that works. But for now, please give a, a, a warm round of applause to, applause to um, Paul Leseman. Good morning. Um, thank you, Jeroen, um, for this um, uh, warning uh, in advance. The warning that uh, I will use data and you will see some charts and tables um, but I will try to explain them very eloquently. Um, so um, I would like to take you uh, on, a, on a journey, uh, an explorative, exploratory journey. Uh, and one of the things that uh, puzzled me and my team and also the bigger research team on which I will report today is um, how can we design systems? How can we govern systems in such a way um, that they reach out to parents and children who need the extra support? that they are inclusive to uh, cultural minorities, to language minorities. Uh, what are the key aspects of governing our systems? So um, let me uh, share my conclusion in advance. There is no easy solution. It's not just about setting up universal, publicly funded preschool systems. That may be an option for very wealthy countries, but usually it's not an option for the less wealthy countries. It's also, of course, not about having completely privatized markets, which is a solution taken in some other countries. So maybe there is something in between, and that's, I hope, I can argue, uh, I can take you on this journey, and I hope that I can convince you that we should look for the middle way in this sense. So I'm going to talk about um, research, research that has been conducted in the, in the um, 
framework of um, the ISOTUS project. Um, ISOTUS stands for uh, Inclusive Education and Social Support to Tackle Inequalities in Society. And we aim at identifying the starting points for policy and practice at several system levels. And today I'm going to talk about especially the level of the local municipality type of organizations um, in order to increase equity and inclusiveness in our systems. Uh, the whole project consists of several sub-projects. I'm not going to talk about all these projects. I'm going mainly to talk about the large-scale interview studies that we have conducted with parents of Turkish, Maghrebian, Roma, and low-income native-born uh, communities in 10 European countries. These uh, interviews give us an idea about decisions that parents take to either or not participate in early childhood education and care, um, the experience support that they have um, in, in, uh, experienced in their, uh, uh, in their cities where they live, and uh, we can relate that then later on to the system's design, and especially also to how the systems are governed. So, ISOTIS is a project with 15 partners, conducted in 10 countries, including also two NGOs, and indeed ISA is one of them. Uh, it's funded by the European Union, and I will talk a lot about the ISOTIS project. I also will talk about a previous project with the same team, it's called the CARE project. So let's start. Um, and also my acknowledgement to all the partners, all the colleagues involved in this project. So let's start. Um, I think it's not uh, very surprising, and it's not new, uh, when, when I'm saying that the field of early childhood education and care and also related fields like the family support services are very complex. Um, it's not easy to classify them in, uh, let's say, clear types or clear categories. So we have ECC services that are split, they are mixed, they can be fully integrated, unitary systems. It can be about full-day childcare, it can be about half-day preschools or kindergarten, and also after-school care is, is part of the system. We have provisions usually for the zero to two-year-olds and um, for the six, three to six-year-olds, and in some countries for the zero to four-year-olds and from the four to six-year-olds. So they can be universal systems, but they can also be uh, contain targeted programs. And there can be uh, what is called progressive universalism. So the system is a universal, but there is progressively more support whatever is needed. ECC services are provided by public, private for profits, private not for profits, and or also by missionary organizations, which leads to what we will call system hybridity. And system hybridity is often regarded as a negative condition. It makes things less clear. I will argue that system hybridity actually offers opportunities. And one of my messages today is, let's seize the opportunities that system hybridity offers to us. Difference between systems also concern the age at which there is legal entitlement, uh, which relates to availability. If there is legal enti entitlement, governments have to make sure that there is also space, that there are places, that there is, that there is provision. Um, the age of free provision is also a characteristic that distinguishes between systems. So um, there can be countries in which at age four, the system is completely free. There are countries in which uh, in which at age two and a half, the system is already completely free. And this relates, of course, to the afford affordability. And finally, an important characteristic is also the amount of public expenditure. How much does a country invest in children? How much does it invest in their systems? How much does it invest per child? So these are characteristics, and this makes the field very complex. And this also leads to the fact that there is no easy solution to what is the best way of governing and designing our systems. Let me talk a bit about a study which was conducted by Özgün Unver and Idas Nikaz within the CARE project. And recently, uh, Özgün did her dissertation defense in Leuven on uh, this research. They used a database on uh, 31 countries in which parents were interviewed, asking them about the use of ECC, and, and also about a lot of family characteristics. And in this particular study, the use of ECC was related to uh, system characteristics, like the degree of privatization or system hybridity, the age of legal entitlement, um, free provision, whether it was split or partially integrated or fully integrated system, uh, staff qualifications, and the proportion of spending. 
And uh, system characteristics can be related to the use of ECC, but you're sure, of course, you should control for family characteristics because a lot of decisions that parents make do not depend on system characteristics, but are on their own preferences or are on their own beliefs. So what did this study learn? First of all, and this is a complex chart, as you can see, but the bottom line is, first of all, there is very wide variation between countries in this study. Uh, and this especially pertaining to the provisions for zero to two-year-olds. Um, so the range is from close to 0% of participation to almost 60%, and that's the, Denmark, the Danish case, case. For three to five-year-olds, the picture is um, more favorable, you can say. And then the, the coverage, the use is ranging from 40% to nearly 100%. Um, large differences, so for the zero to two years between countries, but also large differences between countries for, in use of the three to five years provisions. Can we explain that? So here are the main findings of the study by uh, Unver, by Oscar Unver and uh, Edith Nikes. There are significant positive country level predictors of use, and here, is the, here are they in the order of importance. The age of legal entitlement. The earlier entitlement is uh, guaranteed in society, the higher the use. Public spending. The more spending in a country, the higher the use of ECC. Salary of teachers, professional training level of teachers, indicators of quality. The higher the quality, the higher the use. There are also some interesting, what we call, interaction effects. So, a um, bit technical maybe, but we can see that early entitlement especially benefits the low income groups. Um, whether a system is unitary or split or fully integrated also has relations to use by specific groups. And here is a more complex picture emerging. Integrated systems benefit especially low-income native families. But split systems, when they have a targeted approach, when they do have something like targeted outreach measures, benefit especially migrant families. Interesting in this case is also that there is not a real clear main effect of system hybridity. So apparently it doesn't matter whether the system is completely public or is mixed or is completely private. It depends on the other characteristics. One of the leading lines in the dissertation of Özgün and one of the conclusions of this work seems to be that the most superior type of provision seems to be the public universal unitary system as is found in the Nordic countries. And I want to place some, some remarks, some questions to this uh, conclusion. Before doing that, let's talk about the basic big models of uh, how to run, how to design and govern ECC systems. First of all, the ideology of neoliberalism and the idea of privatized ECC, ECC markets. Um, so it's an ideology. Um, it has had a profound influence in many countries in the world, in Europe, in the United States, of course, in Australia, uh, in many other countries. Um, and so here are the main arguments of introducing market forces into ECC. So introducing market forces would lead to a better coordination between demand and supply. It would include also a greater variety and more options of choice for the parents. It would also lead to a rapid expansion of the supply, a more rapid expansion of the supply uh, than when a government should organize a public system. It would introduce entrepreneurship and innovation and also higher cost efficiency. Privatization, liberalization would also lead to a more efficient quality regulation with parents' users choosing for those options which have the most optimal cost quality balance. And in the end, that all would lead to higher quality and lower costs on the, on the macro level for society. Well, there have been a lot of criticisms. Um, this model has been criticized, especially from the field of the early childhood education and care. Um, so I think most of you know this criticism. And, but I think we should take a sort of nuanced position here, a more, let's say, let's, let's be a bit open. So some of these claims are actually true. There are countries in which privatization led to an enormous expansion. There are countries, and I will show that later on, in which privatization actually indeed leads to higher quality. 
But of course, it's most of these claims are not true, or they are not true uh, without um, conditions that counteract the brute force of the market forces. For instance, Helen Penn, but also Brennan from Australia and uh, Nauman comparing the UK system and the Swedish system have argued that privatized markets that seem to function reasonably well, seem to produce reasonable quality, actually are very strictly and very in a very detailed manner regulated. And they have strong monitoring systems in place. So it's not that liberal. We also see that in privatized markets, um, governments tend to um, switch to additional repairs, for instance, to, to, to ensure that there is supply in remote areas or in areas where the so-called purchasing power is lower than in other areas. Because if you leave it to the market, ECEC provisions tend to concentrate in areas where the more wealthy people live. They can pay for it. So with these repairs and with these counteractive forcings, there is some kind of balance in there in the neoliberal model of privatized ECC markets. Let's compare it to another model, the, the parallel model. And I call it the ideology of the social democratic regimes with their universal, unitary, publicly funded or publicly run systems. And I will ask, put some critical remarks here um, because this system seems to be the most favored one in our field. And I would I like to put some critical remarks here because we should not be leaning backwards. We should not be self-satisfied with this. So here are my critical remarks. For instance, if we look at the quality of education and care in Denmark and Norway, and there are some recent data available. Um, for instance, Slot Blazes and colleagues using the class, which is an observation instrument for process quality. Um, they looked at the emotional quality and the educational quality in the Danish community-based universal preschool system. And he found that the quality was quite low, especially in the ed educational uh, area. Lower, for instance, than the quality assessed with the same instrument in the privatized Dutch daycare system. Moser et al. for Norway used the Itus Eckers uh, scales, which is another observation instrument to assess quality. Um, the quality of the Norwegian uh, sampling, there was a random sample of, of Norwegian centers for, for the, uh, one to six year olds. Um, the, the, the average quality was between low and good, not that high. And actually substantially lower than what was found in the Netherlands with the same instrument, and also uh, lower than what was found in Australia with the same instrument. Um, we also the same instrument was also applied to the Danish system, and similar findings were found. There is another point, and I hope that the Flemish guests here, I see them in the middle of the room, are not offended. But um, look at, for instance, a system like in Flanders, the two and a half year to six kindergarten system, which is universal, publicly funded. Um, Vandenbroek, for instance, um, did an intensive uh, video-based study into the inclusiveness of this system and found that Actually, there was low cultural inclusiveness. Actually, there was a quite dominant uh, assimilationist uh, attitude among the teachers and among the practices in these centers. And maybe this is a risk which is more generally, when we talk about publicly run or publicly funded systems, that national agendas tend to dominate in these systems. Um, maybe, for instance, the same holds for the French, two and a half year to six uh, ECC system. Peterman in the Flemish system also found that there's um, an indication that these kindergartens provide impoverished language environments for migrant children. So here were some critical remarks. Let's now look at what we found in the ISOTA study on uh, how parents, different communities in Europe uh, participate in um, early childhood education and care. It's based on a study, uh, interview study with almost 4,000 parents. Um, countries um, were selected uh, to represent different welfare regimes, different ECEC systems, different policy contexts. And within these countries, we also selected different localities, different urban regions. Um, also with the idea of, let's see how much national versus local governance matters. So, here is our team of interviewers in the Netherlands, and uh, in every country, similar teams were uh, sent out in the field to talk in personal ways with the parents. 
Here is the first result. Um, this is split down. I hope you can read the graph, the charts. Um, we did this study in four communities, uh, the Turkish immigrant community uh, in four countries in Europe, the Maghrebian community, Maghrebian stands for Moroccan, Tunisian and Algerian parents, families, in three countries in Europe, the Roma people in three countries in Europe, and also low income national native born, it's difficult to exactly define them, but let's say the lower uh, working class families in uh, uh, eight countries. So if you look for um, uh, the participation rates reported by the parents in uh, the interviews, and if we control them for all kinds of family and parent characteristics, we will see, we, you can see that there, is a, there are some differences between the groups. Um, for instance, we see that Overall, on average, much lower ECC use is reported by the Roma parents. And this is, of course, not so new, because we know this already. Um, and interesting later on is to see whether we can see differences between countries and also differences between localities within countries. So overall, less used by the Roma group and also tendentially by the low-income and national group. So first of all, how can we explain parents, uh, patterns of use by family and parent characteristics? What we have found in this study is that for us, especially the education level of the parents is a strong positive predictor of uh, use of ECC, but also parents' education aspirations, modest work status, the experience social support, and adoptive acculturation attitudes and inter-ethnic contact suggesting that participation in ECC in Europe depends a bit on how well you are already integrated. And it could also may mean that if you are not that well integrated, the system is not appealing to you. So the, here is something like a sort of difficult, a, a, a sort of cultural, uh, the, a cultural gap maybe at stake. We also found that the importance of rich in daily life is a strong negative predictor. And of course, this relates to preferences for parents, to belief systems of parents, but it could also indicate that there is a cultural barrier at stake. Um, the number of children in the family and poverty also were quite strong predictors, and especially in the Roma group, poverty was one of the strongest predictors. Negative predictor, if you are poor, then it's more difficult to participate in early childhood education and care. Con controlling for all these parent and family characteristics, and there were a lot more, still there is some variation, some differences in participation rates that can be related to countries and localities. And I'm going to explore them more in depth by looking at the patterns for the different groups. Um, before doing that, the countries participating in our study can be roughly categorized in different system types. And you can see already from this categorization, which is rough and debatable from many perspectives, that it is a complex, aspect, a complex uh, issue. So we have in universal integrated unitary systems uh, in our sample, by, uh, represented by the countries of Norway and France. We have also universal unitary systems with a later entitlement, uh, for instance, represented by Italy, Netherlands, Portugal, UK. We have split systems in the early years, and we have also split, partly targeted, um, with limited expenditure systems, with late entitlement to universal, uh, to universal preschool, um, represented by the countries Czech Republic, Greece, and Poland. So this is a bit background knowledge. Let's look now at the use of ECC by age of the child, and by study site for the Turkish group first. Uh, controlling for the family covariates. We see that um, there is an effect of study site. We see also that there is effect of study site by timing. Overall, we see higher use of uh, ACC in the London region and also in the Oslo Trondheim regions in uh, Norway, especially after age one in Norway. We see another aspect, a very steep rise in both Dutch cities, Utrecht and Rotterdam, uh, and we see a small, um, uh, also a steep rise in the smaller Norwegian towns. We see a steep rise in participation in the Manchester, uh, Liverpool, uh, rural area in uh, between age three and four. So there are different patterns within countries. 
Let's reflect on it. Norway has a universal unitary ACC system for children from one to six years. It's accessible and it's affordable with very generous public funding. Yet, there are clear differences between the large urban areas and the smaller areas. England, UK is a split, deeply privatized system, but with a strong tradition of targeted and outreaching measures, for instance, the program Sure Start. However, nowadays, under the conservative administration, um, it's largely dependent on local policy whether this targeting and outreaching takes place. And that might explain the ex differences between the London uh, findings and the Manchester Liverpool rural area. Uh, Germany split, privatized, but mainly not for profit NGOs. Highly decentralized, with a varying role of local governments, and explaining probably the differences we found between Berlin and the Bremen, Mannheim, and other smaller cities areas in Germany. The Netherlands, split system, uh, work dependent access to the zero to four services and targeted preschools for disadvantaged communities from two and a half to four. Um, we saw that a vast majority of the Turkish Dutch families start to use targeted programs at age two and a half. So indicating a strong effect of this particular targeted policy. Let's look at the Maghrebian group. Um, a bit similar pattern, different countries, different study sites, um, but more or less similar patterns. Especially the timing uh, differs between the countries. So there's not an overall average difference in use of ECC between the countries for the Maghrebian group, but we see a steep rise in participation, once again in the two Dutch cities, at age two, between age two and three, which relates to the targeted policies. We see a relatively late rise of participation in the Parisian suburban areas north and east, and also in both Italian cities, Milan and Turin, Turin and involved in this particular comparison. Let's reflect a bit. France has a universal preschool system, whole week program, starting at age two and a half. Highly centralized, publicly funded, and still we see differences between Paris City and Parisian suburbs. Italy has a universal preschool starting at age three, uh, run by local municipalities and non-profit organizations, publicly financed. No differences between Milan and Turin. Relatively late use of the ECC system by the Maghrebian parents in these cities. Netherlands, once again, daycare system, but also this targeted preschool, um, and we see, again, as in the Turkish case, a steep rise in participation um, between age two and three. Now for the Roma people. Uh, once again, controlled for all the family covariates. Um, and we see that there is an effect of study sites, so there are differences between the study sites. And we see also that there is an effect of timing and study sites. Overall, there is higher use of ECC and an earlier increase in use in both Portuguese regions and also in Brno in Czech Republic. <clears throat> we see a late rise in ECC in the both areas in Greece and also in the Usti not Labim, I hope I pronounced this correctly, my Czech is not very uh, developed, I must admit, and also in other smaller towns in Czech Republic. Our reflection, Czech Republic has limited provision for the zero to three year olds, uh, universal free preschool from age five, as, as I'm, I hope I'm correct here, um, it has a strong decentralized policy with local NGOs actively involved in targeted programs, especially also for the Roma people. Um, we see in this system uh, emerge differences between the cities between in, in the Czech Republic. Greece has limited provision for the three to three-year-olds, universal preschool uh, from a later age, but with very limited national resources and also limited local action only uh, some limited, highly targeted support for the very poor group. So no and we see in this system no differences between the two sides, but it is a very low uh, uh, participation uh, in ECC of the Roma people in, in Greece. Uh, in pro pro Portugal, uh, also limited provision for the zero to three-year-olds, but um, uh, targeted programs for Roma, and um, also given the recent decentralization of uh, national policies in, in uh, Portugal, a stronger role for the municipalities. And Porto area seems more successful than the Lisbon area in this regard. Now, I can do the same for the low income nationals, but this graphic, this chart is of course far more difficult to read, far more cities involved, so I will very briefly address this. High overall use and early rising use in the German uh, cities. 
uh, especially Berlin, um, low and late rising use in woods in Poland and also in the both Czech cities and in both Greek areas. Reflection, German locations show relatively high and relatively early increasing use by low income national Germans and this is part of the, the recent policy in Germany to increase this, this uh, ECC participation substantially. It helps, especially for the low-income national German. It doesn't, it helps less so for the Turkish people in Germany, as we have seen. Um, so low use increase in Czech Republic, uh, no major differences between the sites. Um, and what we also can see is that in the majority of countries, universal preschool or kindergarten from age three or age four or age five leads to nearly 100% use by the low-income national families. To summarize, participation in ECC for the zero to three year olds is overall low, but higher in countries with early entitlement and with general public spending. Participation in ECC for three or four to six year olds approaches the maximum related to the onset of universal publicly funded preschool kindergarten systems in most countries. National systems explain part of the differences in early ECC use, while targeted policies explain especially strong increases in participation by our target groups, so the immigrant groups, the Roma communities, um, and the low-income groups. Local context effects also suggest an important role of local organizations and local policies. And I want to explore this further, and I'm looking at Jeroen if there's still time. Yes, there's still time. Um, not so much looking at ECC participation, but especially on uh, what is the kind of institutional family support families experience, especially when the children are young, so in the zero to three periods. Um, and in this particular study, part of the ISOTRIS project, we looked at local governance models in 10 countries, and in these countries, uh, two or more uh, urban sites, um, interviewed policymakers, service providers, and this resulted in country reports that address four dimensions, four dimensions that we consider important to understand the, 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 eff, the, the effectivity uh, of local governance of family support and probably also early childhood education and care systems. But let's first talk about family support. So what is important in countries is the degree of decentralization in terms of legal authority, responsibility and budget, and also the so-called principle of subsidiarity, meaning that in some countries this principle holds that, um, uh, that the government should not do anything if it is already there, if it is already provided, for instance, by charities or by NGOs. Another dimension is the degree of intersectoral integration versus intersectoral segregation. So segregation can depend on different funding systems, different salaries and, and working conditions agreements, on different ministries responsible for the sectors. A third dimension is what we call system hybridity, and I already addressed system hybridity in a sort of challenging, adventurous sense. Maybe system hybridity is something that, that has something in it. And, and I hope I can show you that later, I can convince you about this, that system hybridity actually gives some opportunities. System hybridity means that there is a role of public institutions, and this role can be very, can be very large, so then this, the system is not very hybrid. But if the role of public institutions is balanced by the role of non-governmental uh, uh, organizations, by charities, and especially by activistic organizations with a social emancipatory mission, then we have system hybridity, which has something like, like well, there's, a, there's something in it. I hope to convince you. And a final dimension that we looked at is, of course, the degree of coordination power or persuasiveness at the local level. What is the power of municipalities or of a dominant sector in a particular urban region to stimulate or even to enforce collaboration between uh, organizations? So this is the frame. Now let's look at what we measured, what we measured in the interviews with the parents. Uh, we talked with the parents about how many home visits they have had received, um, how, many, how, how many contacts they had with service, services, how often they used services, how satisfied they were with these services, and we created indexes to address um, differences between groups, differences between countries, and also differences between localities. There are large differences, and I hope the chart illustrates this a bit, but you can see that the bars are sometimes going under the line, the zero line, which is the average, and sometimes they are going up the zero line. What we see from this complex pattern of data is that uh, low-income native groups overall are better reached 
than other groups. And if we can compare native groups with, for instance, immigrant groups, uh, for instance, in England and Germany, we can see that the native groups are better reached than the immigrant groups. There are relatively low scores for Greece and for Norway. Interesting, Norway. Uh, relatively high scores for Poland, also interesting. And Czech Republic. Can we explain that somehow? It's not simply a relation with the country's wealth, as you can see, because Norway is very wealthy, Greece is not. Um, Poland is relatively wealthy at the moment, Czech Republic also, but they are not, let's say, the typical wealthy countries in Europe. So there is something different at stake. Let's look a bit at the country reports. For instance, Poland, which stands out with uh, high scores for the parents. Parents receive high uh, support uh, in the early years. What is at stake in Poland? Well, it's a national framework. It's even included in the constitution of the country that legislation should always be based on respect for freedom and justice, but especially also cooperation of authorities, social dialogue, and the principle of subsidiarity. There is strong centralization in Poland of budgets and responsibilities, not only responsibilities as in some countries, but also budgets. Uh, and also at the municipal level, the principle of subsidiarity holds. So this gives room for NGOs. In Poland, by the way, these NGOs are typically the, ch the church-related organizations that work with the poor. They are funded by public subsidies, but they work with the poor and they are non-governmental. Whatever you think of the role of the church, um, it's clear, and I will I'll be, I can illustrate that later, that these charities, these church-related charities, have close contact with the very poor in Poland, with the very poor in the cities of Warsaw and Woods. And finally, the cities are characterized by networks, by the municipality organizing networks, directing networks, coordinating networks. So there is relatively high uh, power of the, at the local level to uh, operate these networks. Poland, uh, high scoring in terms of experience support by the parents. Czech Republic, different case, also quite high scoring, but completely diff but differing from Poland. So decentralization has taken place there. Um, outsourcing, including involving uh, NGOs, is legalized. But there is not a real clear framework like in Poland was. Um, but this lacuna offers space for local governments to do things. Also in Czech Republic, the country reports sketch networks of support activities related especially to the, the, the topic of education. So education is the driving idea here. Uh, emancipation of Roma groups, of low-income groups through education. That's the driving idea. Whatever you, whatever you like about this idea or not, um, it's a driving idea. Yes, so that's, that's the point to be taken. Um, characteristic of the Czech situation is the important role of NGOs, uh, and especially the non-profit idealistic NGOs that are active for Roma children, for instance. And you can see them, and this is also how it is reported by the by people in Czech Republic, they, you can see them as a sort of disruptive interventions. And this disruptive interventions, so they are doing things and they are presenting values in the local areas, which are not necessarily the values of the state or the state-run uh, education sector. And that also leads to ideological struggles, for instance, what about languages? What about the, the home languages, the heritage languages? So these struggles are interesting. They are indicative of a system which is, is moving, a system which has dynamics. So these are two examples of cases in which the parents report a lot of support, relatively speaking. Let's look at Greece, uh, which was at the lower end, low experience support. Strongly sec uh, a strongly centralistic country, uh, and also a strong sector-wise segregation. So the different sectors do not communicate. They have different pillars in the, in, the, in the governmental hierarchies. No clear role for NGOs. Um, the local networks of public services um, are either not there or they focus on a very specific, very poor subgroup. Interagency collaboration in these locations is very rare. And this, these are so two quotes from, from the, the country report. So the belief in joint action is not commonplace among institutions in, in the, the Greek areas. Norway is an interesting case because we would expect that Norway would be more on top. 
wealthy country, well-developed social sector, et cetera, et cetera. Looking at Norway specifically, we see that the ECC system is decentralized uh, at the community level. It's universal, supply-driven, well-funded, uh, well but the other sectors are regionally or even nationally governed, and this holds a particular for child protection and child welfare, and then that, this regard the system is hybrid. Um, and so this is not, there is some, there is, in that sense, intersectoral segregation. Universal progressive support services are there, and they are, uh, um, um, they are established, well established, but they are demand driven. Co-locations of services of different disciplines are there in family centers, and these family centers typically are uh, uh, established in the heart of the city centers, not in the neighborhoods where the families in need are living. There is no role for NGOs. Uh, and there is a not predominant focus on prevention and early te detection of developmental disorders, family problems, child abuse, neglect, but not so much on social inequalities or inclusiveness. It's about parents who want to find the best service. So this is the system in Norway. Um, and then as a final illustration, United Kingdom, England, and then specifically the London and the Manchester Liverpool rural area in the northwest of England. There's a strong tradition in England of interagency work supported by national legislative frameworks, for instance, Ch Every Child Matters, Children's Trust, and the Sure Start project. High ambitions were there. Uh, joint training, joint accreditation of staff, crossing the intersectoral boundaries, etc. But this was on, under new labor. And then the, 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 the conservative government came into power. Severe budget cuts. Um, and most of these ambitions have been killed, according to our informants. Um, local governments, at the moment, can, but don't have to, strive for interagency collaboration, for coordinating a network of support services. And actually, it is happening less and less, according to our informants. So, you can't read this, but this is a coding scheme. And we can classify countries by on these four dimensions. And believe me, we did this in a decent way. And in the rightmost column, you see the scores for the countries. And now, of course, it is very interesting to relate the scores for the countries to the scores of the parents. How did parents perceive their, their support systems? Before doing that, I want to make an extra addition. We saw that within countries, there are differences between localities. So considering this within country variation, we added an extra dimension which relates to how well the local system seems to be able to outreach to parents with a migration background, parents uh, with a Roma background, parents with a low income background. And we saw, for instance, that London is superior to Manchester, Liverpool, Wirral, that Berlin is superior to Bremen and other uh, smaller towns in Europe, that Paris City is superior to the north and east suburbs, and that Porto was superior to Lisbon. And so we created an extra dimension and added a bonus point if early ECEC outreach is relatively high. And for the final exercise, and this is for the, for the researchers among you maybe most interesting, we used corrected uh, effects on how parents experienced the, the, the support system in their, in their localities, uh, corrected for ethnic group differences. And this is what you get. You can create a governance index enriched with this local bonus of early outreach, and you can put that in a chart with uh, experienced uh, social support, experienced family support by parents, and we see that there is a relatively strong relation. These are the 20, 21, 22 uh, locations, these dots, and you see that there is a relation. Decentralized governance, focus on tackling inequalities as a, as a mission. Involvement of missionary NGOs and outreach to families through targeted measures, especially relate to more experienced uh, family support. Of course, this is suggestive evidence. It should be replicated, it should be seen as, um, well, uh, indicating that there is an interesting study field here. In summary. So, we have tentative evidence that local governance strategies can influence the provision, accessibility and use of family support by groups at risk. And, um, and this especially uh, pertains to the early years, and these early years are foundational, as we know, and still um, 
difficult to, um, to involve parents in uh, systems, in ECC systems. So this is a very important finding. A social emancipatory outreach mission together with positive equity and inclusive attitudes of service providers, NGOs and local governments as a strategy at the local level, as a dynamic strategy operating within a hybrid system, holds the best promise, I think. How can we optimize this? I think that targeted, value-based regulation is needed to increase outreach, to increase access and use, and to provide high-quality dose to those who need it most. Um, putting in place in hybrid systems, in which you have perhaps privatized markets, but putting in place targeted measures, targeted incentives, coming with targeted criteria to evaluate uh, organizations and what they do, can be a push in the back of organizations and networks with a social emancipatory mission and with strong connections to the target groups and their neighborhoods. I will stop here. Um, there was a third part. Um, I leave that for a next op uh, occasion. Um, and I think um, I made my points clear. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, if this was the European contest for the use of digital media, I think the 12 points would go to Albania, because there was one question. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure, can we put it on the, on the board or? So now everyone is typing in their, their own questions, but there was only one two minutes ago, I think. There, on the right. Is it beneficial to, to the child to participate in early childhood education and care at zero to two? Um, the, evidence, the evidence is not conclusive on this. Um, in the care project, I mentioned the care project, and I can refer you to reports on this, we found that there is almost conclusive evidence that it is beneficial for all children, and especially for children in disadvantaged communities, to participate from age three, or age two and a half, to six, but before that age, it's not so clear. Um, before that age, the quality of the provision needs to be much higher. That's for one thing that's clear. We do know, we do find uh, evidence that, uh, especially for children in disadvantaged and more extreme disadvantaged communities, participation before age three can be very beneficial. So this is a differentiated answer to your question. At younger age, of course, you have to deal with uh, the views of parents, with the beliefs of parents. Um, not all parents prefer um, using early childhood education and care at an early age. Parents who do not have both uh, a job, for instance, and do have family-centered values, which I would cherish as such, they may not be the best candidates for participation in early childhood education and care. And therefore, I think early childhood education and care systems should always be complemented with services like family support and other services that reach out to families that can help them in child rearing, that can advise them on language use, etc. Well, in the meantime, I don't see any new questions, so I think this is um, where we should should thank Paul for his inspiring speech and, as I said, full of data, but that's how I know him. And uh, I think that, that that makes it also very interesting because it, he always has a story, but the story is uh, corroborated by, by, by strong data. Um, and maybe you can tell about, in, in a few lines, is it more qualitative or quantitative data that you use or do you have a combination of Combinations. Both? Always combinations. <laughs> well. That's a shorter answer <laughs> that, that you can expect of a question like yeah, that. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh,